Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with Mickey Kashtan, author and NBC teacher, uh, as well as a consultant. So, so Mickey, I've, I've read your most recent books, Reweaving Our Human Fabric and Spinning Threads of Radical Aliveness, and I am excited to, to chat with you about them. Uh, my understanding of your work is that a lot of other uh, NBC teachers, practitioners, and consultants have really focused on you know, individual relationships and, and, and community building on a micro level, which is uh, immensely important. But what you've also tried to do in addition to, to that work is try to create systems that take some of the, the principles of, of nonviolent communication and apply them to how we how we design society and how, how we coordinate among groups. Is that is that accurate or how would you define it? I I love the focus that you brought to it. I, I would say that is part of it, a big part of it. And then the other part of it is to look at how the systems that we have influence our internal lives and our relationships so that we get a sense of the context within which our individual struggles happen. And a lot of people find immediate, instant relief to recognize that what they are up against isn't really just individually created. So it's both ends of it. And as you try to create this sort of macro systemic uh, philosophy, what sort of principles do you think from NBC that you, uh, you've taken and applied to this macro lens or, or where does it differ? Or how have you sort of gone about it from a methodological perspective of designing that, that macro philosophy? Thank you. I'm not going to be able to obviously remember all the different principles. I, think, I would say the overarching design principle is always the question, how does this system, this situation, this configuration, this organization, et cetera, how does it change when you look at everything through the lens of needs? So, you know, if you think, for example, economic system, how does an economic system get transformed when you make the goal of it to be attending to needs within the means and resources that are available, which is very different from the goal of maximizing profit and growth so so that's a design principle and then as applied to different systems different situations different considerations different principles specific to the situation arise so I, i'll give you an example of one such principle which is a principle that i call the principle of willingness which basically means that whatever is done whatever happens happens only because there's someone who is willing to do it. Willing to do it and able to do it, etc. That it's it's a it's deep principle of no coercion. So that's an example. You know, it's interesting, Mickey, I, I read your book at the same time that I read this other book uh, by Robert Wright called Non Zero. And I well I found I agreed with with a lot uh, in both of them. They have a little bit different viewpoints. There's been this debate over society about, you know, the original state of nature versus sort of the uh, Hobbes view versus the noble savage sort of Rousseau view, which is, are we born super kind and collaborative and then educated into, into violence? Or I'm simplifying a little bit, or were we born, you know, in sort of a state of war, you know, because we have economic relationships with each other, we're now aligned in different ways. That's sort of the argument of, of non-zero is that uh, as we align with ourselves, you know, do international trade, we realize that if, if we're to fight each other, you know, we will hurt ourselves in the process because we have economic relationships with each other at scale. And that's why it's the, the least violent time in terms of wars. That, that's sort of the argument of, of that book. You have a sort of a, a take on the biological argument for love as opposed to sort of the moral or philosophical. Can you get into that? I um, build very much on the work of other people. This isn't anything that I've done original research about. The main person on whose work that argument is based is Umberto Maturana. Uh, He is a Chilean biologist, and he has a book called 
the origins of humanness in the biology of love. And the thesis that he makes in that book is that a long time ago, we evolved separately from other primates into what he calls the biology of love, which specifically has to do with the extended nature of our childhood that extends in some ways into our entire life because we are all dependent on love for our ability to function. And he has specific things, um, you know, even things like the shape of our hands and how that is different from the shape of the hands of um, other primates, a shift that makes it easier to caress, for example. It's, it's really fascinating to see, the, to think about the possibility that we have had physiological changes to our makeup that are based on having evolved in a lineage that requires love for its functioning. And so his argument is not that we cannot do dominance and submission and we cannot do war. Of course we can. We are doing it. His argument is that when we do it, it makes us sick. Because what our physiology needs is love. So that's part of the argument. And then on top of that, there is the work of a feminist gift economy theorist, Genevieve Vaughan, who maintains through a different angle, reaches similar conclusions, which is that the intensity of the need to care unilaterally for a child, an infant when they're first born, there's no exchange possible. It is unilateral giving that the act of mothering requires. And it isn't that it's necessarily done by mothers. Uh, she coined the term motherer, which is the one who does the mothering. And the activity of mothering is to orient to the needs of another and respond to them as well as you can. That is a very different orientation from the orientation of the Hobbes, etc., that says we're basically individual beings out there to protect our own needs and fend off everybody who tries to intrude. It's just a very different picture. I imagine you'd push back a little bit on the uh, on the thesis that, although, although maybe maybe not uh, the thesis that. Over time, one, one of the reasons why humans have gotten less violent is because we have more economic relationships. I don't believe that we have actually gotten uh, less violent. I think that's a thesis put forth by Steven Pinker and not one that is accepted by everyone. It, it's, it has a lot to do with how you define violence also. How, how do you define violence? Or, or... Uh, or what you include under violence. Do you include uh, structural violence, if you do, it's only been increasing. Because if you look, for example, at the last 10,000 years, you will see systematically over the course of that period that you end up having more and more wealth and power in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And there's ample literature that talks about how inequality, more so than absolute poverty, determines states of violence within a society. So there, there's a lot more factors than just, you know, measuring homicide. And I honestly, I didn't delve into that debate a lot. I just am aware that it's not, um, you know, like a fait accompli that we all know that we've become less violent. What would need to be true for you to feel that we are getting less violent or over, over time? Like, can you unpack a little bit about w what that could look like? I, I have a sense that I would need to have evidence that people's lives are uh, in, include less suffering that comes from invisible forms of violence, like being coerced, like assault on dignity, all these kinds of things. One thing you've been exploring in your work, which I think is pretty cutting edge stuff, is what is the role of of money or what replaces money or how do we engage in sort of trans transactions? What have you learned or, or if not a clear proposal, what, uh, what sort of philosophies might uh, underlie a, a future proposal that, that you'd prefer we, 
we live under? Fundamentally, I question whether we have the possibility of continuing to exist as a species if we stick with the exchange and accumulation economy. It goes very deep for me. It's even deeper than money because I don't think that barter is a big improvement on money. It's a small improvement. Obviously, barter, you know, direct barter, but, you know, kind of like those clearing houses of resources. So long as it's based on exchange, we are interfering with flow. Uh, the way that I see it is when needs are on the table and resources are on the table and there is there are relationships of trust, then what will happen is the resources will flow to where the needs are. And, and what I am mostly wanting to do is to restore flow. And obviously I can't do it on a global level. Um, so I do it in micro, in micro environments. And the experiments are complex and challenging and unbelievably rich. How do we uncouple giving from receiving? is one deep question. And how do we release excess is another deep question. Because excess and scarcity are, co are co-born through the processes of exchange and accumulation. So would, would, would somewhere to say, hey, I guess, you know, free, just trying to understand better why money is not, you know, freely consenting individuals purchasing. Money is sort of, in some sense, bartering at scale, right? It's because yeah, but, I, I, but bartering is still exchange. It's still exchange. It's still I'm giving you in order to receive. That is where the issue is. Money makes it worse, it be, but it's not the source of the issue. The source of the issue, as I see it, is that when I give in order to receive, we are no longer in relationship of flow. The flow ends. It cancels each other the desire for reciprocity sort of cancels flow. Yeah. So for people donating money, is that is that inter of interest or is that sort of just build upon like anything involving money at some point involved exchange? Where did the money come to you from to be able to donate? It came from some form of extraction. How, how do you think about the sort of, you know, the ideal do you sort of paint the ideal society so that we can, is it sort of, you know, shoot for the moon, you'll get closer to the stars, that sort of, that sort of thing? Or how do you do, you know, think about sort of, you know, what's ideal versus what's realistic given the train that human society is, is currently on? The train that we are on is going in the direction of extinction. More and more people are realizing it. Because of extracting resources from the planet or, or leading to extinction in what form? There are several pathways. There is climate change, near-term potential extinction of all insects. There is depletion of um, uh, soil. There is depletion of water. Every which way you look, we are overshooting the capacity of the planet to sustain us. This will come down crashing. Again, I'm, I don't do primary research, but I read a lot. And just to resummarize, the uh, anything that involves exchange interrupts flow and is not natural, or and it's suboptimal to interrupt flow. And ideally, we'd have a world where we just did things that were yeah. which just contributed to our flow. Is that? Yeah, flow is a form of natural abundance, and abundance is not about having more than you need. It's about the the kind of trust in life that it regenerates when we don't overdo it. And we, when we overdo it, it won't be able to regenerate. Yep. And in, in one of your books, you sort of unpack what a society would, would look like under, under some of these principles. Can you talk about a few of the different components of, of that society? Sure. Uh, for example, in terms of the, the economic system, it's all based on resource flow. That, that means as localized as possible. 
and flow between regions operating on the basis of communication about what's available and what's needed and constant adaptation. So it's, it's almost like imagine doing supply and demand without money interfering. Now, what happens? The reason, if you, you know, classical economics maintains that our needs are limitless. And that's why we need to have the pricing as the equilibrium. If you take the, the view that our needs are finite, and you can see that, you, know, you can just feel it when you are hungry, there's a finite amount that you can eat. And then you won't be hungry anymore. So there's something clear about a need when it's fulfilled. When needs are manufactured or when we live in fear, then we will want more and more and more. And then we need all these mechanisms. But if there is direct relationship to what is it that I really need and what are the resources available and what is it that you really need and how do we work it out to distribute the resources in a way that will most support all the needs known, it changes everything. I'll give you an example that I that I heard about that uh, some years ago, there was a ballot initiative in the state of Oregon that uh, was going to create what some people call single payer, which is a euphemism for socialized medicine and socialized health healthcare. And the people who put the proposal together worked very hard to create algorithms and methods for how to distribute procedures, things of which there wouldn't be enough for everyone. And the proposal was shot down because people said that it was rationing. Now, it still is rationed now. The rationing is happening through money, not through need. So the fact that I have a need for whatever that medicine is that is more acute than yours, let's say, has no power in the system because if you have more money, then it will go to you. So it is still rationed, but it's not seen as rationed because we have accepted collectively and implicitly that rationing things based on money and wealth is a completely fair and just system. It is interesting. So, and how, how would you, um, how would government be, be designed in terms of this non coercion philosophy? Yeah. Um, so, I want to distinguish between government and governance. Government is a form of governance, and it's not the only form that that is uh, possible. There are multiple other ways for creating what I would call self governance. Uh, that is iterative and concentric, where people, first of all, again, it's about localizing. Most decisions are made locally, and to the extent that they can't be made locally, there is coordination between neighborhoods, between regions, between continents, etc., and the coordination happens through methods of uh, selecting representatives that remain accountable to their local neighborhood, not to a totality of people that they are anonymous to, but they remain accountable to their local neighborhood and they don't have any particular power other than the power of coordinating and continually checking with all the others. I, I've um, worked with a group of other people and we actually uh, fleshed out this thing into an actual model uh, that we submitted to a, an international competition. We didn't win, but it was great fun. And it's all available on my website. All the design documents are there. So people can look for it if they're interested on the fearlessheart.org under resources. Yeah. And, and one thing I just want to get, make, make sure I really understand, uh, why, is, going back to violence for a second, in the days of your, or the days we're talking about that were, that were less systematically violent, what did that look like concretely? What was different then that, than is now? Okay, so first of all, I want to say, neither you nor I actually know what yeah. happened. Yeah. And I want to emphasize again, 
I am I'm not a primary researcher. I rely on the work of other people. The work that I'm relying on is not mainstream, and much of it is not recognized or accepted by mainstream anthropology or archaeology, but there is extensive work being done on identifying pre-patriarchal societies that were societies of peace. One piece of the work has been recently validated. It's the work of Maria Jimbutas, uh, who did extensive research about Europe, old Europe, Neolithic Europe. Apparently, based on that work and other people that have done it later, what is now Europe was peaceful, egalitarian societies that were already sedentary, so it wasn't hunter-gatherers. There's more and more acceptance that hunter-gatherer societies were egalitarian, but these are sedentary societies that are egalitarian, lived in peace for hundreds of years, and that was destroyed by people who invaded from the northeast, from what is now the steppes of Russia, more or less. And when she she deduced all of this on the basis of archaeological findings and was uh, completely vilified by the establishment. But just recently, like a couple of years ago, there's now DNA evidence that supports her theory. It, it, it's very complex because the field of knowledge is not, is not separate from worldviews. What we think we know is very much filtered through our worldviews. If we have two different worldviews, we'll, we will look at the same artifacts and we will make different conclusions. You, you mentioned um, in, in, a, in a talk, or perhaps in your book, that at some point humans broke away from being a part of nature and began to see our role as controlling nature. Can you talk about uh, or unpack that and, and when or where, or where that, that took place or, or, or manifested? So, so um, this is all conjecture uh, in terms of how it happened, but it clearly happened, some version of it happened multiple times in different parts of the globe. My understanding of it is that the seed of it was traumatic events, most likely some version of climate or geography change that created an experience of deep scarcity that under conditions of scarcity and trauma lead to separation because you go into survival mode. And when that happens on a mass scale, it will result in disrupting egalitarian structures and creating structures where the people with strength end up controlling the others and trying to control nature. Essentially, if you feel like nature betrayed you and it happens sufficiently and you don't have the space and the context to recover from the trauma, you will pass it on both systemically and individually. That's the simple short version of saying it. And one thing you, you also talk a lot about is, is the role of shame uh, in society. Can you talk, uh, and, and the desire to become shameless, and it, it, sort of the commentary that today we sort of, we don't say that in a positive way, so we say it in a sort of a negative way, that people should have shame. Can, can, yeah. you, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how uh, your understanding is, is that's evolved? So the way that I understand our evolutionary makeup, the ideal conditions for us is to live in groups, in small groups of 100, 150 people where we, we all know each other and we all collectively care for all of our needs. Within such a context, we are very vulnerable creatures. So the strength of the group is essential to the survival of each individual. And so if any individual is acting in ways that threaten the well-being of the group, there need to be some mechanisms that will pull that person back in. That's my sense of how shame evolved as a social mechanism that will prevent people from taking action that will threaten the well-being of the whole. 
what's happened since patriarchy started, again, it's a conjecture, all of it is conjecture, is that shame moved from being an ex- a thing that happens in extreme conditions for the benefit of the whole. From that, it shifted to being a normal, ongoing mechanism of uh, socialization that is designed to protect the powerful, not to protect the whole. And so now, instead of being really rare, shame is a common everyday feeling. This is what every child experiences as part of being socialized because the process of socializing is telling you that you need to be different from how you are in order to fit in. Fundamentally, that's what socializing is. Challenging who you are and what you want so that you can fit in with what the adults and society at large expect of you. And is is your understanding that child rearing used to be different? I wish I had the reference, but yes, it is. I, I, I saw an article not too long ago that was talking about how um, devastated, you know, the white settlers were in this country when they saw the freedom that children of the indigenous population had. They could not accept that way of treating children with with care and respect. You know, going back to your point about the system working for the most powerful and the least powerful uh, if I, let's say I was a, an economist. I'm not, but let's, let's say I was an imitating one. And their response might be, hey, you know, to the extent that we all believe that, um, you know, human progress or, or, or the way humanity progresses isn't inevitable. And if we can go back in time and instead of accelerating a, a market, you know, a capitalist based economy, we accelerated a gifting economy or a different kind of economy that might be better in some ways, but there might be some trade offs in, in other ways. And maybe those trade offs would be, that we wouldn't have as much innovation. And so, you know, on one side, we wouldn't have things like Twitter or Facebook, and may- maybe those seem, um, you know, more trivial in some sense. But in, in another sense, we might not have had things like antibiotics or electricity or, or running water for everybody. Or I, um, Do you ex- accept the idea that there might be some trade-offs to that sort of society? And, and if so, th- those types of trade-offs, um, which... Are, are both entertainment and in some sense it's trivial um, in, in no sense. How, yeah. you know, how, what are your thoughts there? My thoughts are, first of all, I don't really like to go back. I like to go forward. So I don't know what would have happened. I just really don't know. I, I How much innovation there would or wouldn't have been is unclear to me. I, I know, for example, and this may not be a very popular example, but in uh, Cuba, which is clearly not a capitalist country, you would think there would be no innovation, but they've had massive innovations in medicine. Massive. Why are they having them if there is no financial incentive? Big question that I want people who believe in financial incentive to think about. That's one thing. So in terms of going backwards, I have no idea what would have happened. The the second thing is going forwards, here we are. We have created whatever benefits we have created through patriarchy, through the market economy, through all of these things. What I would want to do is not to go back and undo these things. What I would want to do is to find a way to integrate whatever we have learned from the experiment in controlling nature, what would that look like to use all the knowledge, all the technology, all the innovation, everything that we've learned? What would it be like if we put all that knowledge to use in reconnecting with nature and with life while it's still possible? Right. And it's interesting because going forward, there's, it's almost in some sense, it can go you know one of two ways uh, in some sense, which is you know, even more technological innovation try to, you know, there are people trying to live for cure aging and live forever and, you know, uh, create, you know, give food and water to everybody by manipulating how food, how food works um, and creating scientifically engineered food and, you know, scientifically engineering diseases and even at the uh, the gene level. Um, And that's, that's one extreme. And then there's sort of another path, which is, hey, 
yeah, which you've just mentioned, we've had the fruits of, of uh, or some of the fruits of capitalism. We've had some of the, uh, you know, tribulations. And uh, can we now go uh, back to a time where we're with all this great in- invention that we've had? Can, yeah, can we now be more in-, in sync with nature, as you put it, and sort of an interesting um, divergence? And there are people um, who are engaging in um, processes and research exactly on how to do that. There's a whole field called biomimicry. Biomimicry is about trying to create processes, systems, procedures, technology, everything that mimics the way that nature works. Um, And that is done in laboratories and in universities and uh, in science. It's just not the mainstream, again, of what you hear about in the media. So lots of people don't know about it. To give you another example of, you talk about innovation, the problem of polluted water is serious and growing. There are biological solutions for that. There is uh, something, I think it's called living machines. It's made up of plants in particular configurations that literally clean the water by ingesting it I don't really know what the mechanism is, but you put those things floating in very foul water, and on the other end, you get clean water. And humans can only do that with with processes that create more pollution someplace else. So, So I think the question is not innovation or lack of innovation. The question is what type of innovation, in what direction, in what relationship, with people, with other people, with, with, um, with other life forms, with the, the earth as a whole. It's, a, it's not a binary question. The whole either or itself, I find problematic. Yeah. And it's interesting because some people might say, you know, we need to innovate and then redistribute. And I think what you're saying is innovate on innovation is sort of like, let's change the route at why we innovate. And instead of going to, you know, from a world of which that is uh, run by, you know, uh, carrot and stick, guilt, punishment, and competition, and, you know, it's getting rich. Like these are, these are sort of the reasons why, or that many people believe that people are motivated to, to innovate, right? The, the chance to become rich or famous, you know, fear of, of not contributing not having any resources, punishment, guilt, shame, reward. And, what you're, uh, what you're saying is, and what NBC, I think, is saying, and you're applying this to macro lenses, you know, there are other ways to be inspired to uh, create and, and give, uh, give, you know, contribute to other people. And these are more long lasting or more durable and more sustainable. Is that, is, that, is that correct? Yes. I also have not seen the let's innovate, get rich, and then redistribute. The redistribution just doesn't happen. Right. And Karl Marx said it would happen. You know, there, you think, you know that there would be a, a revolt at some point, and it it hasn't really happened in a in a sustainable way, certainly. No, that, uh, and I am I uh, just to be clear, I am I would not call myself a communist by a long shot. Where where do you depart from from that view? It's still very much a power over system. So you replace the market with a dictatorship of the proletariat. I don't think we have advanced much as long as there are groups of people that decide for other people what is going to happen. We're still in the same system. And, and you spent time in, in Kibbutzim, correct? A little bit when I was growing up and I also read about it. Yeah. What are the biggest lessons uh, you, you take from, from that? In my little bit of knowledge, well, so in case your you know your listeners don't know what a kibbutz is, it's it's um, it was an experiment in collective living that was done before the state of Israel and into the state of Israel, and is mostly over. Although there are little pockets that are still happening, but um, and it lasted uh, intensively about seventy years. It never um, involved more than about three percent of the population, but it was still an, a, a very unusual social experiment in that people tried to distribute equally economic resources. So um, there were some things that were successful and others that were not. 
Um, the main lesson that I take from it is this. Number one, that needs are not equal and therefore resources cannot be distributed equally. Because if you have five children and I have one and you get the same amount that I get, then we already created inequality by trying to create equality. That's why the principle of needs is, is much more nuanced than complex. That's, that's number one. Lesson number two is that any system, I wanted to have very strong uh, mechanisms for expressing dissent and integrating it to create better and better solutions for how to make the system work. And as far as I can tell, those did not exist in the kibbutz movement. There, was a, there weren't mechanisms built in for integrating dissent into iterative modes of learning. I mean, one thing you mentioned about needs and how it's so nuanced. How do you think about the connection between self-interest or the relationship between self-interest and, and needs and determining between those? Yeah, so needs are biologically given. Um, the methods for attending to needs are socially constructed. So what I mean by this is all of us have a need for uh, nutrition, for food that is going to nourish our bodies. Um, there are no two cultures that satisfy those needs in the same way. What counts as food in one place is considered foul in another. Uh, but the fundamental need is the same. And similarly, we have needs you know, we have physical needs, we have needs for freedom, for connection and interdependence, and for meaning. Those are kind of like the four basic needs that humans have. And there are any number of ways to attend to those needs that, um, you know, we could write many books about. The way that I see self-interest already is rooted in separation between people. The only way that it makes sense to talk about self-interest is if I am a self that is separated from the whole. When the whole exists as a whole, my need is part of the information that flows within the whole. Self-interest is like I am here protecting myself from something else, caring for myself at the expense of something else. So that, that's the way that I see that distinction. One thing I think about a lot is yeah, how do humans coordinate at scale to solve these global problems like climate change, for example? And something I sense from your work is, is it sort of a uh, things get lost in scale. We were talking about, or I mentioned abstraction earlier. Are you trying to like less interested in things at scale and more interested in everything being local? I think th what scale enables is for you to create your locality, like based on people who are more like you or more resonate with you you know, using the internet to, to find them. But how, how do you That's think? That's not locality. That's not locality. I'm very, very sorry. Finding people on the internet that may be in some other place, that's not true locality. Locality is physical. It's where are you located and how do you sort things out there on the local physical level? We are so far from that in modern industrialized countries that it's hard for people to imagine how that could function. But I want to, I want to go directly to the question of, of climate change. The way that I think you can scale this is I see one of two ways and, or, or some mixture between two ways. One is you create a, a basically a random sample of, at this point, this is a global problem. It's not specific to this or that country. So a, a, a random sample of all the people on the planet coming together, working out what to do is one way of doing it. The difficulty with that is that although it will be representative, it's unlikely to include the people with the most wealth. And the reason is they are so few that the statistical chance that they will show up on a random sample is very small. 
So what I would do instead is do is bring together what what uh, what is known as a multi-stakeholder group. I think if we brought together uh, CEOs of energy companies, climate scientists, climate activists, and random samples of specific communities, and they sat together and were facilitated well to arrive at a solution at a policy recommendation that, that takes into consideration all their perspectives, their needs, their ideas, and their concerns about the situation that we're facing, I believe that we would solve the problem. The desire for reciprocity is a very natural, but natural is a loaded term, but you know, humans tend to expect reciprocity for things. Maybe you'd accept that, maybe, maybe you would. The, the, the argument could go. In one sense, we're asking ourselves to overcome our desire for reciprocity. Would we also ask ourselves to overcome our uh, temptation to compare to one another? So I, I would say this, you know, the experiments that I have seen and read about that are trying to prove that fairness is built into everything don't necessarily prove it to me because fairness is a concept and the same experiments could prove that I care about all needs being attended to, which is a different frame than the frame of fairness. So I don't know that we actually have a desire for reciprocity. I think that we live in a consciousness of scarcity and separation and powerlessness. Within that construct, we will compare each other. We will want reciprocity. We will be afraid. We will have self-interest. We will protect ourselves. All of these things are the consequence of a particular worldview, particular consciousness. We don't have hardly any human beings that are living outside of that consciousness. There are tiny, tiny pockets still remaining. For the most part, that's the prevalent consciousness of humans on the planet now. I don't know what that proves in terms of, of what is possible for humans. And, and these tiny pockets, is, is that the nonviolent communication community? Is that, is that a different... No, 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 no. I'm talking about tiny pockets of societies that didn't go through the patriarchal move. And, and where are those societies? Um, one of them is the Mosuo in China. Uh, that's one that I have heard and read about. There are a few other very, very small pockets, and they are being encroached upon and, uh, and on the verge of extinction also. At some point, maybe it's a few years, maybe it's, maybe it's a decade, but virtual reality will get so good that we will think we are with people. It will, it will be almost as if it were real. And that's less what I'm asking. What I'm asking more so is what's lost when, when it isn't, you know, real, you compare you and your neighbor who may not know anything about nonviolent communication or may be very different than you versus, you know, you find another nonviolent communication, uh, you know, in a different state who becomes, you know, a super close friend. I, what's, what's lost when we are not in the same place? Physicality of caring for needs. When we are in the same space, there is something about physical resources. Virtual reality can never replace the physicality of food, you know, sending our kids to school, those kinds of things. I don't believe personally that we have enough time left for us on the march for virtual reality before we actually are going to have no reality left. These are some... Uh, some exciting ideas, and I'm, I'm excited for them to get more, e- even more discussion and more, more, more people being be familiar with them. What's your understanding of how Marshall Rosenberg himself may have viewed some of them, or, or where do you think you depart from him or, or other NBC teachers? Obviously, there's a lot that, that is inspired by and very similar, but where do you think there are any differences? Okay, first of all, a lot of my thinking has, has come from reflecting on you know, very short phrases that Marshall Rosenberg said that have stayed with me and that I keep mulling over them. And here's one that has been very, very significant where he said these words, don't ever work for pay and make sure that you have all the resources you need to do your work. I've been thinking about this one for about 15 years And uh, in some ways, all my thinking about the gift economy has emerged from that one sentence. 
so m my belief is that the vision that Marshall had and his understanding of needs and their centrality infuses everything that I do. I think I would say, I don't know that I would say that I depart from him. I think where I develop things that he left implicit would be more like it is in the area of interdependence, which is how do we actually engage with other human beings, not just in conversation to resolve conflict, but to develop the capacity to collaborate, to work together, to care for each other, to, to include an understanding of our impact on other people in what we're doing, to care for the systems that we co-create. All of this is there in Marshall, but remains implicit. He didn't develop it and he didn't codify it in the way that he codified dialogue. And in terms of other NBC trainers, I would say not all, but most NBC trainers, like you said in the beginning, are focused on internal processes and interpersonal processes without the systemic context within which we live, without the worldview context within which we live, et cetera. Totally. And, and, and unpacking that phrase a little bit more, never work for pay and make sure you have anything, everything you need. How does, how, how does one do that? It's hard to do that without having a web of relationships. I can tell you that at this point, I have enough of a web of relationships where that is mostly true for me. I, there isn't anything that I say yes to because of money or no to because of money. I do things based on their intrinsic alignment with what I'm trying to do in the world and alignment with my values. And in terms of where does the money then come from, as I make the needs of the organization that I am part of known, and more and more of the things that we do are done on a gift economy basis. So, for example, if you come to one of the retreats that I do, along with other people, uh, you will be asked to cover the room and board costs Beyond that, there's no particular expectation of any amount of money that you will give or not give. You're perfectly free to come, participate in the retreat, cover your expenses, and go home without giving a cent. Because I wouldn't want you to give out of obligation. I would only want you to give because you are connected with what your money will make possible. And this is working. But it can't work without having a solid web of relationships. The more solid relationships you have, the less money you need to have in your bank account. For, for people who are really inspired by these ideas, Mickey, and want to learn more in addition to uh, the two books, uh, and you have some, some more as well in, in your blog, where might you point um, So first of all, I have uh, five or six conference calls on different topics that I offer every month that are entirely free. There's no way to pay for them. And that information is on the website that I mentioned earlier, the fearlessheart.org. That's also where I blog. And if people go there, they will find everything from there. Thank you so much. It's, it's been inspiring reading your work and, and talking to you now. Uh, I'm eager to encourage people listening to uh, either join the conference calls, to, to read uh, Mickey's books, her blog. She also has uh, a bunch on YouTube uh, that, I, that I've checked out. And I uh, just want to thank you, Mickey, for, for coming on. It's been, it's been really great and excited to, uh, excited to have had this conversation. Thank you. It was a pleasure. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 